Um, <clears throat> as Michelle said, uh, the title of this talk is The Power of Words, How the Constitution Eroded Native American Sovereignty. And as I, when I first thought of that title, I thought it was really great. I thought it was uh, kind of strong and you have to punch. Um, but then I thought about it, and I probably shouldn't have uh, included my own biases uh, in the title. I probably should have kept it simple so that after the talk you could have, um, and you can still do this, I would welcome it, uh, form your own opinions on how the Constitution uh, affected Native American sovereignty. So when I uh, talk about the Constitution in my History 150 or 151 class, um, I usually start out by asking the students uh, what they think when they hear the word sovereignty. And a pretty basic definition that I found um, says the supremacy of authority or rule as exercised by a sovereign or a sovereign state. Um, you could also think of it as uh, the complete independence um, of a self-governing entity, a territory existing as an independent state. Um, these are pretty strong words. And what my talk is going to be about is the, uh, the sovereignty of American Indian tribes and how the Constitution, in just a few sentences, um, impacted that idea, that sovereignty. <clears throat> so I thought, uh, to begin with, we would need a little bit of background information on what was going on in North America um, before the Constitution was ratified in 1787. In 1781, uh, the American Revolution came to an end when General Cornwallis surrendered um, in Yorktown, uh, Virginia. And this was going to have a significant impact on American Indians because uh, up until that point, they had had uh, the luxury or at least the opportunity of uh, choosing between different um, governments to ally themselves with. Um, during the revolution, um, they, they could choose between the, uh, the colonials or the British. But once the revolution ended, they no longer had a choice. They had uh, no choice but to accept the new American state, uh, the American government. So <clears throat> what had been a land of uh, Dutch and English and French colonies now became kind of a, a loosely held together union of 13 states, or what would be uh, states, uh, the original 13 colonies. Now these colonies um, often uh, conflicted with each other over um, Indian law and uh, the power of a, of a colony or a state over Indians. Uh, and sometimes the settlers within a particular colony um, took the law into their own hands. So it became evident pretty early on that the United States needed some kind of uh, uh, cohesive, centralized government, uh, some way to run the country without stepping all over states' rights. And one of the, uh, uh, this might be an urban legend, I think there is some truth in it. Um, one of the inspirations our founding fathers uh, drew from was the uh, Haudenosaunee, or the Iroquois Confederacy, that was living in New York um, prior to contact and up through the Revolutionary War. Now, why get inspiration from the Haudenosaunee? Well, the Haudenosaunee was a confederation of five different Indian tribes that were um, ethnically and culturally related, okay? Uh, the Oneida, the Cayuga, the Seneca, the Mohawk, and the Onondaga. And by uh, the early 18th century, it included the Tuscarora tribe as well. And collectively, they were known as the League of Nations, but they identified themselves as the Haudenosaunee. Now, the Haudenosaunee had a very um, elaborate form of government prior to European contact. Um, and some say the Haudenosaunee represented the very first uh, democratic system in North America, maybe even in history. Uh, and that's because the League of Nations um, 
operated on a council system. Each tribe uh, sent members to one large council that would make decisions for the entire confederacy or league. The, uh, the number of representatives from each tribe was based on the size of the tribe, okay? So it was proportional, um, kind of similar to our Congress, um, how we choose uh, our House of Representatives, um, how we choose um, uh, a certain number of Congress people uh, based on the state's population. The other thing that the uh, League of Nations had was a very uh, strong emphasis on clan mothers. Um, the Iroquois tribes were matrilineal, which meant that, uh, or which means uh, that um, clan affiliations are passed through your mother, not your father. And the clan mothers um, had a significant amount of uh, clout when it came to choosing council members. So they would choose uh, council members from among their tribe, but they would always keep a veto power, okay? They could take back um, council members, in other words, take them off of the council, um, and they could also veto decisions made by particular council members, okay? This is starting to look like the American system of checks and balances. Or maybe the other way around, maybe the American system was starting to look more like uh, the League of Nations. <clears throat> and as I said a minute ago, the council would only make decisions for the entire Confederacy, decisions that affected all six tribes equally, um, like going to war, or who to ally themselves with. Keeping that in the back of their heads, the Founding Fathers um, uh, created the Articles of Confederation in 1781, and it would have been their first attempt at uh, creating a document to form a central government uh, for the United States. And, but the Articles only mention um, American Indians in one place, Article 9, and this is, um, I think, uh, a verbatim uh, uh, quote from the Article. Congress may regulate the trade and manage all affairs with the Indians, not members of any of the states, provided that the legislative right of any state within its own limits be not infringed or violated. What does that mean? I have no idea. Um, it sounds like a very uh, confusing balancing act between what would become the federal government and the state governments. And I think the Founding Fathers realized this was a very confusing statement early on. Um, when you think about it, how could Congress really act um, or regulate Indian affairs when they were trying not to trample on states' rights? Um, that is just, uh, uh, that's just a legal controversy waiting to happen. And as much as I like to practice law, I would not have wanted to get involved in that. After the Articles of Confederation passed in 1781, uh, the United States government, the new United States government, uh, decided to engage uh, several Eastern Indian tribes in treaties. And these treaties were known as organic treaties. There were three uh, significant ones that I can think of. Um, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, uh, the Treaty of Hopewell, and the Treaty of Fort Finney. Um, but all we really need to know about the treaties um, right now is why all of a sudden the United States went about making so many treaties with Indians. Um, and you can see a number of Indian tribes were affected by these treaties. The Iroquois Confederacy, um, the Cherokee and the Choctaw, and the Shawnee tribes. And generally here we're talking about land in the Northeast, New York and Pennsylvania, um, in the southeast, um, Tennessee, Kentucky, um, Georgia. Land. Of course, land is the reason or the motivation behind the organic treaties. The United States started off um, in a very humble position. Even though they had defeated the British during the American Revolution, 
they did not have very much money. Okay, the, the colonies could not afford to arm their men well. They couldn't afford to um, um, lavish gifts on local Indian tribes to gain their alliance. So one of the things the country did in order to um, just get people fighting on their side, uh, fighting on the colony side, um, was to promise land to soldiers after the war ended. Um, and where did that land come from? Of course, it came from the Indians. So this map represents um, Indian land as it existed in 1750. Now, I know it might be hard to read some of the names uh, on the map, but the, uh, the green colored portion represents um, uh, European colonial settlement. And the tan portion represents uh, predominantly Indian land. So this is 1750, um, 30 years before the Articles of Confederation. So the United States, almost as soon as it, start, it was uh, created, started um, entering into treaties with Indian tribes to acquire land uh, and to make good on their promise to continental soldiers and militiamen. This map represents American Indian lands 240 years later. The colored portions represent the Indian land. So <clears throat> even though the previous map was only uh, the eastern part of the United States, I think it's obvious that a considerable amount of land, hundreds of millions of acres, um, were lost as a result of treaties made between the federal government and various Indian tribes. Just keep that in uh, the back of your minds for a moment. <clears throat> when, it, when it realized that the Articles of Confederation wasn't working and it was very difficult to govern Indian affairs without trampling states' rights, the United States uh, government, our founding fathers, <coughs> took it into consideration when the Constitution was being drafted. And the Constitution mentions Indians in just two places. The Constitution, if you uh, sat down and read it, is, you know, a fairly good-sized document. Um, but it, it bestows an incredible amount of power on the federal government, uh, creating the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches of our system. And here is the text of uh, 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 those two places where Indian, Indians are mentioned. They both come out of Article I of the Constitution. And the first one deals with uh, choosing representatives to Congress. The second place, Section 8 of Article I, is the most important. And we're going to be talking about it for the rest of uh, our time here today. It's been uh, it's been called the Indian Commerce Clause. And it says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes. Now that doesn't sound like much, right? I mean, it's not really saying what specific powers Congress has over Indian tribes. It just has this uh, blanket statement about commerce. What's so interesting about federal Indian law is that since the founding of the United States, or, or since the ratification of the Constitution, this, uh, this clause, uh, Section 8, has been um, expanded, has been contracted, has been defined and redefined by Congress and by the Supreme Court. So hopefully today you're going to get a sense of uh, how that's happened and how it's impacted Native American tribes. Of course, there are other articles that don't mention Indians specifically, but they do have some impact on Indian law. Um, for instance, Article I, um, no state shall enter into a treaty, alliance, or confederation. Well, how would that affect Indian tribes? Well, what it means is that states can't enter into treaties. That is uh, the province of the federal government, okay? So the Indians, if they had read Article I of the Constitution, 
would get the idea that from there on in, they would be dealing with the federal government in terms of treaty making. The states were going to be out of the picture for the most part. Article 1 also goes on to say that no state shall enter into any agreement or compact with another state or a foreign power. So regardless how an Indian tribe could be defined, if it was considered a state or a foreign power, other states could not make agreements with the tribe. Now in 1791 we get the Bill of Rights. The Founding Fathers felt that uh, there were some personal freedoms that were overlooked in the Constitution. So the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution, um, give us five personal rights and five rights that deal with criminal procedure. Basically what happens when you get arrested. The question uh, remained, and it was never fully answered, um, whether or not the Bill of Rights applied to American Indians. Okay? And I wrote on the slide, wait 177 years. Um, seems like a long time to wait, but uh, hopefully not the way I uh, briskly go through this presentation. Um, but the United States government is going to deal with this question in that time period. So, just before we move on, where are we? Well, uh, the United States government now has a constitution, and it has a Bill of Rights, but not really a, a good sense of what rights Congress has over Indian tribes. Um, just a very general statement about regulating commerce with the tribes. We also have a Fifth Amendment issue, and that Fifth Amendment contains the Due Process Clause, um, which says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Um, this is going to become important uh, for our purposes later um, when we start uh, talking about the different treatment that Indians receive from the federal government, um, at least in certain circumstances whether or not that's a violation of the Due Process Clause, and if so, or if not, why, or why not. <clears throat> the first law that Congress passed that directly affected American Indian tribes uh, was the Trade and Intercourse Act of 1790. Um, what did that do? Well, basically, what the Trade and Intercourse Act did was um, restrict people from trading or doing business with Indian tribes or individual Indians. Um, traders needed a permit from the federal government in order to trade with Indian tribes. So they have to be, traders have to be licensed by the federal government. They forfeit their merchandise if they don't have a license. And Indian tribes are restricted from selling their land or property to these traders. Um, the only way they can acquire land is by making a treaty with the federal government. So right off the bat, um, Congress uh, dove into regulating commerce with Indian tribes by restricting who Indian tribes can do business with and who can do business with Indian tribes. Um, the reason that uh, there are three dates listed behind the Trade and Intercourse Act uh, is because the Act uh, was renewed every two years, and sometimes changes were made to the actual wording of the Acts. Um, in 1834, uh, the final Act was passed. Now we get into what I think is a very, uh, very interesting area of law, the Marshall Trilogy of Cases. And um, maybe it makes me uh, kind of a nerd for getting excited about this, but um, these three uh, Supreme Court cases basically lay the foundation for Indian law. And they remain cited by the Supreme Court to this very day. Okay. They're called the Marshall Trilogy because um, all three opinions were drafted by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall. Now the first case um, is Johnson versus McIntosh. 
Now, this involved a land dispute between two men, Mr. Johnson and Mr. McIntosh. The land that they were feuding over was located in the state of Illinois, or what would become the state of Illinois. Uh, Mr. Johnson claimed he owned the land because in 1773, the local Indians sold his grandfather the property. Mr. McIntosh claimed that he owned the land because in 1818, the federal government gave him a grant to the property. Okay, So the question for the Supreme Court was, who really owned this land? The man who whose family got it from the local Indians first, or the man who got the grant from the federal government. Well, Chief Justice Marshall uh, looked through history and he decided that title to land comes ultimately from the right of discovery. Who discovered America? The Americans? No, because there were no Americans um, in 1492 or uh, 1000 AD, whenever you consider the discovery of North America. Um, title um, uh, went to the discoverers, um, the discoverers of New France, of New England, of New Spain. But under the terms of the Treaty of Paris, which ended the American Revolution, any prior title by those European superpowers went to the United States. So Chief Justice Marshall reasoned that the United States has ultimate title to this land, this land that we call America. So the decision was in favor of Mr. McIntosh. He was the one who got the land grant from the United States government. So his claim to the land was superior. But the significance of, uh, of this case wasn't just over who got the superior title to the land. Um, the significance was what the Supreme Court said about Indian rights to property. And what the Supreme Court said basically was that if title is in the hands of the United States, they own it. Therefore, Indians only have a right to occupy the land. Congress could actually extinguish an Indian tribe's right to any land. The second case came about eight years later, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Now this case is very interesting because it goes back to um, the confusion over the Articles of Confederation. The Cherokee tribe filed a lawsuit against the state of Georgia because Georgia had enacted some laws that were basically outlawing Cherokee tribal government um, and requiring um, non-Indian people to get a license to go on Cherokee land. Those were incredible restrictions. And they were also um, contradicting the Constitution because we already know that the power to make laws over Indian affairs uh, goes to Congress, not the states. Okay. So the question for the Supreme Court before they even got to the real issue of whether or not Georgia could pass these laws legally, was could the Cherokee Nation even sue the state of Georgia? Now, Article 3 of the Constitution uh, <coughs> creates our Supreme Court and lower courts. Um, <clears throat> the question for the Supreme Court was whether or not that article gave any insight into when, where, or how Indians could file lawsuits. Well, <clears throat> one of the things uh, that uh, Article 3 talks about is um, foreign states suing states of the Union or lawsuits between states of the Union. So the Supreme Court had to figure out whether or not an Indian tribe could be considered a foreign state. And the Supreme Court ultimately answered no, it was not a foreign state. And why? Congress has the right to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and Indian tribes. 
So Chief Justice Marshall reread that uh, clause in the Constitution, and he thought to himself, at least this is what his opinion uh, suggests, Indian tribes can't be foreign states. Why would the Founding Fathers mention them separately? Okay, you can't make a list of foreign states, uh, several states, including states of the Union, and Indian tribes. If an Indian tribe in a foreign state means the same thing, they must mean different things. So what were they? Well, Chief Justice Marshall gave us a term that uh, we still use today to refer to Indian tribes and describe their political status. He called them domestic dependent nations. Now, he did make an effort to define what a domestic dependent nation was. He compared Indian tribes or domestic dependent nations to um, a ward and guardian situation. Uh, for instance, if, uh, if a child is abandoned and has to go into foster care, the child could be considered a ward of the state. Chief Justice Marshall was saying that Indian tribes were wards of the federal government. They were, uh, they were entities that needed to be taken care of and protected uh, by the United States. Now this is quite different um, from the definition of sovereignty that we saw in the beginning of the presentation. Um, just looking at the, uh, the phrase domestic dependent nation, um, seems to contradict um, any idea of sovereignty um, because they're domestic and they're dependent nations. <clears throat> so this case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, led to the third case, Worcester versus Georgia. Worcester versus Georgia, even though it was a separate case, dealt with the same issue that Cherokee Nation versus Georgia dealt with. And that was the power of Georgia, the state of Georgia, to pass laws over Indian land. <clears throat> Mr. Worcester was a missionary, and he was not an Indian person. Um, and he was living on the Cherokee Reservation in Georgia without a Georgia license. However, he did have a license from the federal government. So he was obeying the Trade and Intercourse Act that we talked about earlier. <clears throat> well, this case was, uh, uh, was interesting because it's, uh, it's based on the same uh, issue, the power of Georgia to pass laws over Indian land. But it has a different name. It's under Mr. Worcester's name. And the reason is because the Supreme Court decided that an Indian tribe can't file a lawsuit in the Supreme Court. That's why the first case uh, of Cherokee Nation versus Georgia didn't go anywhere. The court was just discussing whether or not an Indian tribe has the right to sue. It never got to the issue of whether Georgia could pass a law um, regulating Indian land. So, in Worcester versus Georgia, the lawsuit was filed by Mr. Worcester with all the support of the Cherokee tribe. The state of Georgia, um, by the way, um, part of the reason the state was um, trying to pass these laws and regulate the Cherokee land was because it suspected the Cherokee land contained gold. The federal government was not going to support Georgia trying to regulate the Cherokee land. So Georgia took matters into its own hands uh, by passing laws about license, licensing uh, non-Indians. When the Supreme Court got this case, um, they had to go back to the Constitution and uh, kind of analyze uh, what power was given to whom. The state of Georgia was pretty um, arrogant about the whole case. They didn't send an attorney to the Supreme Court to argue the case. They thought it was a slam dunk 
but Mr. Worcester showed up along with um, several prominent members of the Cherokee tribe and several um, uh, experienced attorneys. And they argued the case before Chief Justice Marshall. And what ended up being decided was that Indian tribes, even though they're domestic dependent nations, they do have inherent in them <clears throat> uh, a basic right to govern themselves. This was probably the biggest victory uh, that Indians received um, in the first uh, 50 years of the United States existence. Um, it's still cited today as the basis for an Indian tribe's sovereign power. The Supreme Court didn't say that tribes were not domestic dependent nations. It just said that they do have rights, um, inherent rights, as self-governing entities. <clears throat> And the basis for that, um, that decision was looking back over all the treaties and uh, um, relationships between Indian tribes and the United States government and the European colonies before that. Now, getting into uh, some of the treaty rights that were awarded to Indians by the United States, or I should say negotiated with, um, the United States. <clears throat> treaty rights are very important because there were just so many uh, treaties made uh, with Indian tribes. Um, I counted at least 185, and I think there were more than that, um, made over a period of about 93 years. Now, the treaty rights are important for us because the treaties with the United States government were authorized by the Constitution, okay? The Constitution gave significant power to Congress um, and also power uh, to the President of the United States to make treaties. Now, I want to talk about uh, three Supreme Court cases that deal with treaty rights. Um, excuse me, before we get to that, I just want to kind of say that uh, um, the Supreme Court gets a little wishy-washy when it comes to treaty rights. Um, in one case, um, it might uphold an Indian tribe's rights. In another case, it might strike down those rights. And we're going to talk about that in uh, just a second. So Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock is the first case um, that we're going to talk about. Um, it was a 1903 case. and. It arose from the issue of uh, bringing another, an outside Indian tribe onto an already existing Indian reservation. Um, let me go back to this picture. Uh, this is a drawing that was made of the Treaty of Medicine Lodge Creek. And that treaty was uh, made with Indian tribes in Kansas back in 1867. Um, it was one of the largest gatherings of Southern Plains tribes in the history of the United States. There were Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes, uh, tribal members, Comanche, Kiowa members, uh, and Apache members. Between five and 7,000 uh, people convened at Medicine Lodge Creek to sign this treaty. <clears throat> Several years after the treaty was, uh, was made, the United States uh, government relocated the Apache tribe onto the Kiowa and Comanche reservation. They were given their own reservation in Oklahoma under the Medicine Lodge Creek Treaty. Uh, Lone Wolf was the name of a Kiowa man who challenged that move. He said, we negotiated for this reservation. We agreed to move provided that we were going to get a certain amount of land and a certain amount of uh, rations and supplies to help sustain us. How can Congress just relocate another tribe to this reservation? It would automatically divide the land into smaller fractions. Well, the Supreme Court looked at uh, the terms of the treaty. It also looked at the political status of Indian tribes as domestic dependent nations. 
And it concluded that Congress does have the right under the Constitution to abrogate an Indian tribe's treaty rights. In other words, strike them down. Even though the Kiowa and Comanche signed the treaty with the understanding that they were going to get a reservation to themselves, Congress could change the terms of that treaty and deny the tribes uh, some or all of their treaty rights. Now, in the, the other two cases listed here, uh, Indian tribes um, uh, enjoyed a better outcome. In the United States versus Wyman's, uh, the Supreme Court had to consider treaty rights given under an 1855 treaty made with Northwestern tribes. Um, these are people from Washington and Oregon State. Um, <clears throat> Those tribes uh, were traditionally, and to some extent today, fishing tribes, okay? So their fishing and hunting rights were gonna be very important, and they made sure they were recognized in the 1855 treaty. Well, with the, uh, the massive westward expansion that took place in the 19th century, the uh, Northwestern Indians felt their uh, their treaty rights being encroached, encroached upon by settlers. The treaty promised these tribes that they could continue to hunt and fish in their quote-unquote usual and accustomed places. It didn't say anything about usual and accustomed places only on the reservation. It just said usual and accustomed places. So the Supreme Court had to consider this uh, issue and eventually decided that what the treaty said is law. Um, that meant that the Indians could actually leave their reservation and go on to private land to hunt and fish if that private land was in a, a usual and accustomed place uh, for their hunting and fishing. In the Winters case, the United States Supreme Court um, held that an Indian tribe um, maintained its water rights even when it ceded a certain piece of its reservation to the federal government. That happened in Montana in 1888. Um, the, uh, the tribes, I think it was on the Fort Belknap reservation, um, gave a certain piece of land back to the federal government. Um, and the part of the reservation they kept did not have access to the Milk River, which was nearby. So the tribe argued, well, of course we wanted to keep our water rights. What good is our reservation without water? The settlers who got the ceded portion of the land diverted the water from the reservation and started using it themselves. Basically, they had a monopoly over the Milk River. The Supreme Court decided that if the Indians understood this land session to keep their water rights preserved, then that's what should happen. So the water rights on, to the Milk River were upheld for the Fort Belknap Reservation. Now, as the 20th century moved on and progressed, <clears throat> Congress had the opportunity to um, passed some very sweeping uh, laws that totally changed the nature of federal Indian law as we knew it, or as it was known at the time. Um, and Congress, Congress's actions were always authorized by the Indian Commerce Clause. Um, I told you in the beginning of the talk that we would go back to that <clears throat> time and time again. And now we're going to see exactly how Congress used that Commerce Clause. <clears throat> After years of making treaties with Indian tribes, um, putting them onto reservations, and trying to assimilate them into the dominant culture, that being a Western education, um, conversion to Christianity, um, and accepting and using the English language, the United States government uh, decided that there was so much despair on reservation land um, that they needed to do something to kind of lift up or boost
Indian tribal governments so that they could be stronger and maybe self-sufficient. That came in the form of the Indian Reorganization Act, which was passed in 1934. I think part of the reason it was passed was because um, federal, uh, um, excuse me, Franklin Roosevelt was in office at that time. Um, he was um, creating the New Deal programs to cope with the Great Depression. Um, and it was just a time of reform. He appointed a man by the name of John Collier um, to lead the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the Indian Reorganization Act um, was his brainchild, John Collier's. <clears throat> Basically, what the Indian Reorganization Act did was present Indian tribes with the opportunity to vote on accepting a reformed government. And very often, the, the reformed government would look similar to the United States government a government that had a constitution, um, maybe a president, um, and maybe a tribal council, similar to our Congress. So when Indian tribes all over the country were uh, presented with this opportunity, 174 of them voted to accept or adopt Indian Reorganization Act governments. 78 rejected them. They wanted to maintain some sense of tradition, and preserve their self-government. Um, <clears throat> the tribes who accepted the Indian Reorganization Act um, basically ended up getting boilerplate constitutions that said very little um, uh, about their tribes specifically, um, and, and just basically set up the tribes to look like um, puppet versions of the United States government. <clears throat> some of these governments are still in existence today, and some Indian tribes have gone out on their own and formed their own system of government, either based on a tribal council, um, uh, a chairmanship, or um, uh, a tripartite system, a system with an executive, legislative, and judicial branch. Well, if you, if you thought that was an era of tribal sovereignty, um, it was short-lived. It barely lasted 20 years. Because in the meantime, the United States had fought a very expensive war, not only in Europe, but in the Pacific as well, World War II. The United States, even though it, um, it achieved victory in the war, left with an incredible amount of debt. Um, many soldiers stationed around the world in these very delicate places um, and a looming Cold War on the horizon. Congress decided in the early 1950s that it needed to do something to um, push Indian tribes out of the nest, make them self-sufficient, so that the United States government didn't have to keep footing the bill uh, for their programs or their, uh, their governments. The first step uh, towards that kind of uh, uh, economic planning was Public Law 280. What Public Law 280 did is uh, it gave jurisdiction over Indian land from the federal government to state governments in five cases, California, Minnesota, Oregon, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. This did not mean that Indian tribes didn't have any jurisdiction over their own uh, communities. It just meant that um, the predominant government would be the state, not the federal government anymore. In a way, this was kind of like uh, Congress was using its power under the Indian Commerce Clause to give some of that power to the states. Okay, and that would cut down on expenses. Public Law 280 um, is still good law today. California remains a Public Law 280 state. 
therefore the state has jurisdiction over Indian land um, in terms of uh, uh, criminal uh, and some civil issues. But the Indians were never asked about this change. Uh, nobody approached uh, tribal governments, tribal councils, and asked if they would mind if, uh, if jurisdiction shifted from the federal government to the state government. The second step that Congress took towards uh, washing its hands of responsibility for Indian tribes was the Termination Act of 1954. Now, the, the act called for terminating certain Indian tribes, but how do you terminate an Indian tribe? Well, in this case, Congress uh, terminated a tribe by basically ending any government relationship between the tribe and the federal government. The federal government would no longer give funds or sponsor programs for that tribe. Any land or money that the federal government held on behalf of that tribe would be distributed so that the federal government um, had no responsibility left. This was, uh, for the 100 Indian tribes affected, a disaster. Um, the people living on uh, land, the people in these uh, 100 tribes, all of a sudden got big distributions, or maybe small distributions, of their own money from the federal government. But they lost their services, health benefits, education benefits, and they were now left to deal with the state. Now, one thing I haven't talked about so far was taxation. I'm only going to talk about uh, taxation a couple of times <coughs> now and in a few minutes. But um, what it meant that Indian affairs were governed by the federal government instead of the state governments was that Indian tribes did not have to pay property taxes on their Indian land, okay, on reservation land or on allotted land. Um, <clears throat> if they were living down the street from me, of course they would, because I don't live on Indian land. So, not only were these tribes losing their benefits, but they were also now going to become responsible for paying state taxes and property taxes. If they got any kind of financial distribution from the federal government, it was probably going to be uh, soaked up pretty, pretty early. By, uh, by those taxes. <clears throat> now, Public Law 280 uh, remains in effect. California is still a Public Law 280 state. But the Termination Act um, uh, is no longer a policy of the United States. Um, as a matter of fact, beginning in the 1960s and 70s, the United States started to um, issue orders kind of reinstating the political status of some of these Indian tribes. In the 1960s, which was, you know, an age of social reform in many respects, uh, the Civil Rights Movement, um, the Beatles, the Stonewall Movement, the United States government decided to <clears throat> reform uh, certain issues under Indian law. And these, are, these acts are two examples. The Indian Civil Rights Act came 177 years after the Bill of Rights. This is what we've been waiting for. Now, the Bill of Rights would apply to individual Indians on Indian reservations. It's not exactly the same as the Bill of Rights. For instance, um, uh, an Indian person under the Civil Rights Act um, does have a right to an attorney, but must pay for that attorney, him or herself. The reason is because Congress didn't want to burden Indian tribes with that expense. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act was another reform that just sought to protect um, an Indian person's right to a freedom of expression and belief and practice of uh, his or her religious traditions. Um, 
The unfortunate thing about this particular act, though, was there was no way for an Indian to file a lawsuit or uh, use this act to their benefit. It was kind of just like a policy statement. The federal government was basically just saying that uh, Indian uh, religious rights should be protected, but it gave no way of protecting them. There are some uh, special rights for American Indians, uh, and I mentioned them a little bit earlier. Um, and they come in the form, usually in the form of uh, Supreme Court cases. Um, and it goes back to the political status of Indian tribes. For example, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has a hiring preference for people of Indian heritage. Why is that not discrimination or reverse discrimination? How can one, uh, one group have an advantage when members are applying for a job? Uh, well, the Supreme Court, in the case of Morton versus Mancari, uh, held that the preference is not based on race. It's a political uh, question. Uh, the Supreme Court, in the case of uh, Worcester versus Georgia, said that Indian tribes have an inherent right to govern themselves and that they are political entities. So by giving this hiring preference, uh, the United States government isn't favoring a race. It is giving a benefit to a political entity, uh, tribal members. Going back to taxation, uh, the Supreme Court in this McClanahan case said that a state cannot collect income tax um, for work done by an Indian on the reservation. That too remains good law. Um, and that case went to the Supreme Court and started out with uh, um, a debate over $16 and I think 32 cents in uh, income tax withholding. <clears throat> and then we get the case of Lane versus the Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association. This was about government land. The uh, Northwest Indian um, Cemetery Association was trying to stop the government from developing land because it would infringe on um, some of their religious traditions uh, or places where they would practice these traditions. But the Supreme Court uh, actually took a turn and decided that it can make whatever reasonable use it wants out of its own land, even if that use um, offends or compromises in Indian tribes' religious beliefs. So this is what I was talking about, how the, uh, the United States government, uh, whether it be Congress or the Supreme Court, can kind of flip-flop uh, depending on particular issues. So we're just about at the end, um, but I wanted to give you an overview of um, how federal Indian law was established and how it was found it in the Constitution. Um, but this is just uh, something I did um, to kind of reflect the um, support for and against Indian tribal sovereignty. These are all cases or laws that I talked about today. And I think, um, I think for the most part, the, um, the laws and cases cutting against tribal sovereignty outnumber those supporting tribal sovereignty. <clears throat> I did put a couple of question marks there because um, the Indian Civil Rights Act, even though it um, provides certain um, protections to Indian people, um, does tie the hands of Indian tribal governments uh, in some respects. And the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, well, it was supposed to help the Indians, but it really didn't have any kind of uh, impact on protecting their religious rights. This is the same definition of sovereignty we saw at the beginning of the talk, and I would just ask you to take a look at it and um, ask yourself whether, whether or not Indian tribes are truly sovereign, given everything that they've been through, and how Congress and the Supreme Court have um, 
interpreted their political status. So that's the end of the, uh, the slideshow. Questions? A lot of what you said was predicated on um, the uh, claim that the U.S. Constitution grants uh, powers. Yes. And uh, where, where does the Constitution get its power to grant, grant others' powers? You know, I think the Constitution um, enjoyed the support of the Founding Fathers, but also the states that had to ratify it. And, you know, the Constitution had to be tweaked several times, but I think the Founding Fathers were in agreement that that Article I, uh, Clause 8, the Indian Commerce Clause, would um, kind of end the confusion over who has authority over Indian rights. And I do think, you know, if questioned, the United States government was going to use its military might to defend that power. So in other words, what would prevent, let's say, the uh, Native American nations or the Indian nations were more military and stronger, and they said, well, our Constitution actually says you have to go, or you have to obey us. It would just come down to a military battle or, or something like that. I, I think ultimately that, that dispute was at the heart of so many battles between the, the federal government and American Indians. Um, which lasted, um, I mean, literal battles, violent battles, lasted all the way up until the 1880s or even the 1890s in some parts of the United States. Now the battles are being fought in the courtroom, um, and Indian tribes are still trying to um, protect their sovereign rights at the Supreme Court. So I think you're, that's a good observation. Yes? Uh, two questions. Uh, in the Worcester case, yes, uh, isn't that tie in with uh, Jackson's sort of allowing Cherokee to be removed from the southeast, or or convincing them to remove themselves? Yes. Did he essentially disobey the Supreme Court ruling in the Worcester case? What did he ignore it? Yes. And the uh, other question, okay, question I have is, I didn't notice the Dawes Severity Act in your your list of positive and negative. No, I, I didn't include it. I was, I guess I was trying to be, um, this might make you laugh, trying to be efficient. Maybe it wasn't efficient at all, but I, um, I will talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, you are absolutely right. The Worcester case does tie into <coughs> President Jackson and his Indian removal policy. Andrew Jackson um, uh, supported a bill and actually pressured members of Congress to support a bill removing the southeastern Indian tribes, the Cherokee, the Seminole, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Creek, into modern-day Oklahoma. And that was in 1830, right before this uh, decision was, uh, was made by the Supreme Court. So basically, um, <clears throat> we get into this interesting situation where the Supreme Court was actually trying to change law that Congress had passed by acknowledging the Indians' right to govern themselves on their own reservations. And there's a quote that, um, I don't know if it, if it was really said, but it's attributed to Andrew Jackson, that Chief Justice Marshall made his decision. Let him try to enforce it. President Jackson didn't do anything to support these Supreme Court cases. Basically, he, um, I think he accepted them with a grimace, but ignored them uh, when it came into passing laws. And the Dawes Act, or the um, Allotment Act of 1887 that you mentioned, that ties into the whole attempt of Congress to assimilate American Indians. Taking Indian reservations and dividing them up into like checkerboard um, parcels of land and giving individual families Indian families, individual pieces of that land. I think it was 160 acres per family, and they were supposed to farm it and support themselves that way. And it was a disaster um, because what you ended up, what ended up happening was a lot of the land was of poor quality, so they couldn't make 
and attempt to farm it. Most of the people who were given a lot of land were not um, traditional farmers anyway. So, oh, and the other, the other issue with the Dawes Act or the Indian Allotment Act was that it allowed Indians to stay on that land for 25 years. And then the land goes out of federal trust and becomes fee simple land. Okay, the Indians would own it outright. But when that 25 year period was up, most of the Indians could not afford the taxes on the land. So they would end up selling it. And then you get this situation where non-Indian people were moving onto the reservation, buying this land for a steal. So, you know, I, I definitely think that's relevant. I mean, Congress, Congress was once again taking Indian tribes' treaty rights and changing them, okay? These reservations were mostly made by treaty, and Congress decided it could divide them up and distribute the pieces to individuals. Well, wouldn't that seem not to contradict too? But I don't know exactly, but you seem to mention in, in one of the decisions that, or rulings that states, and I assume that would be individuals within a state, could not purchase land because they were Native American land. But there's something to that effect. Right. But this seems to say that with the allotment, after the 25-year period, the land can be sold just like any other property rights. Right. So it seems to contradict an earlier, an earlier principle that the land will be held communally and not in a market mechanism. That's right. It's still, even if land was allotted to a non-Indian, it's still considered Indian land. Oh, really? But it's not held in trust anymore by the federal government. Yes? You know, it's probably not standard procedure in the Supreme Court that one side doesn't send representation uh, when, the, when the case finally reaches the high court. Probably not. Probably not. Um, did the fact that Georgia didn't send any counsel influence how Marshall and the um, defendants um, shaped the decision. Did Marshall decide, well, George is not going to defend their position, and so in some way, I'm going to yield to some of the claims of Worcester and by indirectly uh, recognize the Indians? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question, and I, I don't really know the answer to that. But I, I suspect I suspect the decision would have come out the same way if, if Georgia had sent uh, an attorney to make an argument. Because Marshall was a strong uh, advocate of national authority? Yes, and, and because in the previous decision, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, he, he did acknowledge that Indian tribes had some sort of um, political status, some sovereign rights. Yes. <clears throat> Two questions. Uh, with regard to the Wyans case, yes. uh, which allows hunting, uh, is that a case that was used in the Inuit decisions that allowed Alaskan natives to do whaling and sealing? Could that be, could that have been a precedent for that? And the second question, I've never, I'm ashamed to say, I've never read the Georgia cases. Uh, and uh, I don't know, would they, were they in the Western territories that in 1913 under uh, uh, Fletcher versus Peck, of course, had so many problems with the legitimacy of the grant of the lands, were these Western lands of Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi, or were these Georgia lands within the state of Georgia itself? Uh, these were Georgia lands within West, the state of Georgia. In Georgia. Right, to answer your second question. Um, going back to your first question, yes, I think the Winans case was a precedent for um, not only the Inuit cases, but all other cases kind of defining and interpreting um, hunting and fishing rights. But I, I think in 1905, when that decision was handed down, it was pretty significant that the Supreme Court was upholding the right of certain Indians to go on to private property uh, to hunt and fish because that had been one of the rights they treated for. Yes? Um, 
Between uh, the 1700s, when uh, the federal government started getting active with the tribes, um, to later dates like the 1900s, how many tribes were exterminated, as in, you know, um, moved or killed off or anything between that time? Since contact, I, I believe several hundred tribes have been abolished. Um, the United States government um, removed and relocated a number of Indian tribes. Um, if we, if you recall that slide that showed the entire map of the United States, um, many of those tribes um, were the victims of relocation. Um, today in Oklahoma, I think there are about 25 different Indian tribes based there. And um, I believe at the time of contact, there might have been two or three tribes that were native to Oklahoma or were living there at the time of contact. So that right there tells you that about 23 tribes were moved just to that territory alone. There's so also, There's also the impact of disease, which affected the Indian population. So to talk about extermination is a little complex because there's the epidemiological factor. Right. The disease, warfare, relocation. The federal government actually moved a number of Indians to Los Angeles and San Francisco in the 1950s. Um, and those cities today have very large uh, urban Indian populations. Um, but, you know, those two examples of relocation, they both have the same purpose, trying to assimilate Indian people uh, so that the federal government didn't have to support the, the tribes. Well, I think the federal government did have um, some programs in place uh, to help them. And, and that was the case in the 1830s, too. The, uh, the federal government didn't just pick up the Indians and move them to Oklahoma. Uh, they did provide them with supplies, farming supplies, and some wagons and things like that, and certain annuities um, that would pay them money over time. Um, so they would support themselves that way. And for the Indians who were relocated in the 1950s, I, I suspect that um, wherever they were being moved from, they, they received like checks from the federal government for land that they had lost. Maybe it would have been startup money. Yes? How was it determined with the relocation? Was there a different like, uh, negotiations going on between the government and Indians where you know, they made compromises for saying, you know, you can go here or you don't have to, or was it just kind of, they didn't give them a choice, you're relocating here whether you like it or not? Good question. Um, the relocation of the 1830s actually started 10 or 15 years before, but the federal government tried to work with tribes individually to get them to agree to relocate. Not all tribes did that, and even when some tribes agreed to relocation, there were some tribal members who refused to go. That's why today we have the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, but we also have the Eastern Band of Cherokees in North Carolina. Those people would not go. So I think in 1830, when Andrew Jackson passed the Removal Act, that was his way of saying, I'm done negotiating. You're moving, and that's the end of the story. But, you know, he had tried coercion and pressure prior to the law. And you have to point out that he, he and his successor, Martin Van Buren, authorized military action and a forced removal. That's a trail of tears. 25 <clears> percent <throat> of the people that were marching died. Mm -hmm. And it was a it was a gradual relocation. That uh, Dr. McLeod's figure is exactly right. About 25 percent of the population, and the relocation occurred over several years. So it was, a, it was a big deal that was, um, uh, that tribes did not have a choice in, in the end. Yes? I'm sorry, the 25% of the population, said, well, well, what's the total number of population? Is that 25 out of a thousand people, or 25% out of a thousand people, or? Well, uh, the, the five tribes that were relocated to Oklahoma Territory in, 18, in 1830, or 1830 to 38, were the called the five civilized tribes, the, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and uh, Seminole. The Cherokee alone had thousands of people in the tribe. 
So I, I'm not sure of an exact number, but we would be talking more than 10,000 people. So 25% is a substantial amount. Why do you think in the Iroquois Confederacy tribes that they were matriarchal, that they really looked towards clan mothers um, and you know saw them as a kind of dominant force? And also, um, what were some of the general religious beliefs of tribes? The first question, I'm not sure of the of the origin of the matrilineal system among the Iroquois. I know that it predated European contact. And there are Indian cultures all over North America um, and South America, I suspect, that are matrilineal. But then there are cultures that are patrilineal. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know where that, that came from, if it was just a, a special bond that was being recognized between mothers and and children. Maybe it was because the women were, because of a woman's ability to give birth, they were the hope for the tribe's future. You know, maybe that was uh, uh, part of it. Um, as far as religious beliefs, it's hard to, um, it's hard to condense that because there are so many tribes with so many different traditions. Well, I mean, usually there were, there were multiple, multiple gods. There was a creator. Um, there were um, there was a sense of harmony in the world, and that was the ideal state of the world. Um, and that that could be thrown off balance by um, uh, the mistakes of individual tribal members. Um, but different Indian groups had different views of the world, and they had different explanations for their beginnings and, and different ceremonies too. You know, among the Lakota people on the plains, probably one of their most um, well-known traditions was the sun dance, where usually men would <coughs> sacrifice pieces of flesh to the sun <coughs> to kind of show off their, uh, their courage, their strength, uh, their integrity. Um, the Apache, uh, didn't have a sun dance. They had other dances, but they're more more known for their uh, celebration of puberty rites for adolescent women, or girls, rather. Um, and that goes back to the whole um, uh, hope for the tribe's future. Um, by celebrating a girl's entrance into womanhood, the tribe was basically celebrating hope for more tribal members, future generations. But one thing I didn't tell you was that the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968 made it possible for states to give back their jurisdiction over Indian land to the federal government. The reason for that is because, you know, today especially we, we know what the economy is like and I think most of us are feeling the crunch. The states were not prepared or even in most cases willing to accept, accept the financial burden of policing an Indian reservation out in the middle of the woods or the mountains, um, or you know, setting up a court system that could hear those cases. So it was a burden um, on the states, but the Indian Civil Rights Act allowed them to opt out of it. It also allowed states to acquire partial Public Law 280 jurisdiction. So what I mean by that is in Arizona today, Arizona has Public Law 280 jurisdiction only over air pollution on reservation land. That's it. Because Arizona felt that that is all it wanted jurisdiction over. It wanted to regulate the health of its air. Um, going to your second question, was it good, was Public Law 280 good for the Indians? I would have to say, uh, for the most part, no, because, <clears throat> for one thing, they were not asked, and you know, if if they wanted jurisdiction to change hands, I think that was offensive to them, uh, for the most part, and I also think that um, Indian tribes had been dealing with the federal government on some level for 150, almost 200 years. And I think bringing a new government into the picture just really confused things. 
I, I don't think they were getting the kind of attention um, or support that they needed in terms of police power and, and court systems. That's my sense of it. But what if a male or female wanted to leave the reservation and go live in the city? Can they stop being defined as, as Indian and then be have full rights of citizenship? And if you leave the, the unit, you leave the reservation, do you become full citizen? Um, or if not, how do you do that? The, the short answer is they, they were supposed to. Okay, that those rights were supposed to follow them off the reservation because in 1924, Congress passed a law making all American Indian people citizens of the United States. Indians who had received a lot of land in the 1880s were already made citizens. But the problem was there, were, there was not often uh, protection for their rights as American citizens. I'm not a native person. Um, I'm an attorney, and I teach history uh, here at Mesa College. History, uh, Native Americans in U.S. history, 150 and 151. But this was really um, an interest I've had since I was a child. And when I decided to go to law school, I found a school that had a focus on the Indian law. You also studied Native American studies, is that one? Yeah, I got a, a, a master's degree in that program. Um, a master's degree in American Indian Studies, so. I know that because I interviewed the guy. That's right, <laughs> my, my boss asked me questions. So, any other questions? I'd like to take half a second here, just there's a little bit of history in the making here. The person that started our Native American Studies history program here at uh, San Diego Mesa College is John Steiger. John Steiger is sitting here, and John Steiger hasn't had a chance to meet Mark Bazzon no. before, but uh, I just wanted to point out here, there's a little bit of history right here. This was quite some time ago. I've been here at Mesa College 20 years. John retired yes. the year before I came and, and developed this probably 30 years ago. Oh. So. Welcome. Thank you. I do, I do have a question, though. Sure. Um, in terms of the for and against, you listed cases and case law and so forth. Would you, um, looking back since the 1790s, would you um, care to put a political party label uh, on the for and against? Um, I, I don't know. We, 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 today we talk about conservative and liberal and so forth. And, and I'm, in my mind as you went through that, I was thinking of the different political parties uh, in ascendancy. Mm -hmm. And um, Federalists, uh, Democratic Republican, Jacksonians, etc., and even Roosevelt, because uh, the Navajo were very, very uh, resistant against Collier and what his program instituted. So I, I'm just kind of curious. It's a difficult thing to go back over the 200 years and think of all the parties, but yeah. it would be kind of an interesting little uh, challenge. Uh, that is a challenge, um, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm up for that challenge. Um, it, uh, I, I, I'm not sure personally I see any, um, any trends across party lines with respect to Indian laws, but I haven't been looking for that, uh, that pattern. One thing I've noticed is, is the Supreme Court uh, tends to be more um, supportive of Indian rights and tribal sovereignty when there's a liberal majority on the court. So um, looking back at the, uh, the 1980s, um, there was that one Ling case that I talked about that um, actually cut against Indian interests. But by and large, the 1980s was pretty um, successful for Indian tribes at the Supreme Court level. Um, you know, Thurgood Marshall and William Brennan, um, they were very li liberal justices and usually supported Indian tribal sovereignty. Today's court um, has a very strong conservative base, Justice Scalia and Thomas and Alito. Um, so I think I think tribal sovereignty might be put on the back burner 
or somehow threatened today. But in terms of um, our presidential leaders or the, the political parties dominating Congress, I, I'm not really able to respond. I'd like to congratulate you on your presentation. Oh, thank um, you. You, you, uh, you did a very good job of covering a, a broad expanse of material and, and reducing it down to something that was uh, uh, very understandable, I think. Thank you. It was uh, a very scary prospect for me. <laughs> I wasn't sure how I was going to get it on the slides or if you would even stay for the whole talk. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much for coming. I really uh, enjoyed it.